Hello, I am Professor Yash Shankaran in the Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering. Yes, uh, we are going to just look at the uh, some of the salient features of uh, bonding character. So, one of the primary uh, aspect is um, the solid state can be visualized as atoms vibrating about their mean positions on fixed atomic sites and uh, in a liquid state the atoms have also translational freedom important and that can slide past one another. The bonds between the atoms in the liquid are continuously broken and uh, broken and remade. This all uh, we know. In gaseous state bonds are totally broken. The higher the bond strength, the more will be the thermal energy required to break the bonds. Correspondingly, sorry, correspondingly, strongly bonded materials tend to have high melting point and boiling temperatures. So, this is something which we also uh, looked at the uh, correlation with the potential well diagram, right. Um, when you have the, you know, steeper potential well diagram, it has got something to do with uh, uh, bond strength as well as uh, melting point, right. So, we will uh, again um, acknowledge this idea uh, as we just move on. Wherever we try to connect with the atomic basis of the properties, we will be able to uh, connect this idea or carry this uh, along, okay. So, when a solid consists of molecules held together by secondary bonds, the melting and boiling points of the solid reflect only the strength of the secondary bonds between the molecules and not the strength of primary bonds within the molecules. You see, uh, as we just move along, we were, uh, we will see that uh, the, the external force uh, or in this case, we are talking about boiling point and uh, that is a thermal energy or even we, when we say force, it is a mechanical energy. So, how these bonds respond to the external forces. So, that is that is the ultimate point we will reach, right. So, how these uh, primary bonds and secondary bond respond or resist to the external load that determines the, the, the physical property primarily and then mechanical property as well. So, the typical ionic and covalent materials have a good thermal and uh, electrical in insulators, right. And solids which have secondary bonds such as Van der Waals bonds are also good insulators. Now, this is true because most of the ceramic material, uh, they are all mostly uh, covalently bonded or ionic bonding or it mixed, mix, mixture of these two characters together like, like intermetallics and so on. So, the thermal expansion of materials arises from the asymmetry of the potential energy versus distance curve. Deep potential wells are more symmetrical about their equilibrium positions or not than the shallow potential wells. So, the thermal expansion at a given temperature tends to be less for strongly bonded materials than for weakly bonded materials. So, this aspect uh, we will uh, look, at, look at it in much more detail uh, in the coming lectures. So, the thermal expansion of material arises from asymmetry of potential energy well that we have already discussed yesterday by looking at the geometry of this nature of the curve, okay. So, we will connect them uh, by giving examples in the coming lectures, okay. So, these are some of the important salient features about uh, bond characters and properties. So, uh, finally, uh, 
what we are trying to say is the mechanical properties of solids are dependent on strength of bonds as well as directional nature of bonding. Solids with the strong and directional bonds tend to be brittle. For example, covalently bonded diamond is very hard and brittle. So, uh, having connecting, connecting with all the physical properties, we are now uh, saying that uh, mechanical behavior of materials uh, also strongly dependent on the type of bond and, uh, and its nature and also directionality and so on and so forth, right. So, I was just mentioning uh, in the initial part of the bonding, uh, not necessarily you know all covalently bonded materials will be hard because, but there is an another requirement, right. So, the covalently bonded materials will also have a uniform surroundings as in the case of diamond. Even in polymers, you have a covalent bond, but then the, the, the first line of, you know, um, resistance is not the primary bond uh, covalent, covalency there, but there it is a Van der Waals forces which takes the initial load. So, the response of the material is quite different as compared to a diamond type of material, right, where you have a covalent bond is, uh, you know, uniformly are surrounded by all the atoms, all the neighboring atoms have this same covalent bond. So, it is so hard and strong and mechanically it is uh, brittle in fracture, right. So, as metallic bonds are relatively weak and non-directional, metals are soft, ductile and malleable. They can change their shape permanently without breaking. Ionic solids fall in between covalent and metallic solids in that they may exhibit a very limited amount of ductility. So, you have one extreme uh, metallic bond and the other extreme is covalent bond. Ionic bond comes in between in terms of their uh, mechanical strength and the physical property. So, now we will see uh, um, some of the examples. Suppose if you take metals and alloys, and they exhibit a metallic kind of bonding and most of them are polycrystalline. So, the crystal grains they consist of the microstructure consists of crystal grains and advantages they are very strong, stiff, ductile and conductive. Disadvantages they may not have a very good uh, fracture and fatigue properties that, uh, that could be any limitation. And if you take polymers, uh, they are all covalently bonded as well as uh, secondary bonds. The microstructure uh, will show that these uh, materials uh, consist of chain molecules or the microstructure completely contains a molecular chain folded into some crystalline form or entangled form or you know. Uh, tangled form and so on. Advantages uh, in terms of uh, utility, low cost, lightweight and very importantly corrosion resistant, right. So, disadvantages from the engineering point of view, uh, low strength, low stiffness do not have a good creep properties, okay. We will see, uh, we will understand why these things are so as we proceed from there. If you take ceramics and glasses, uh, they are having ionic bond or covalent bond or both, okay. Uh, they could be polycrystalline nature or that could be semi-crystalline or amorphous in nature. Both uh, state of microstructure is possible that could be completely amorphous or semi-crystalline and so on. Advantages, they are strong, stiff, hard, resistant to temperature, very important property and resistance to corrosion is again very important property, very attractive property from the uh, engineering point of view. Uh, disadvantages, they are highly brittle.
And finally, composites, a bonding could be of various uh, combination in, in nature because a composite can be uh, made up of any two or three material together, each one may have a different bonding, right? it could be covalent and ionic or uh, for example, if you take uh, fiber reinforced plastics, plastics uh, it could be you know um, having bonding of covalent and secondary bonds and uh, your reinforcement could be ceramic or it could be metal or it could be fiber depending upon what kind type of reinforcement one wish to add. So, the bonding is uh, various type of bonding possible. Microstructure either um, th there is a two constituents major constituent here one is matrix and there is uh, reinforcement. So, matrix can have one microstructure uh, fiber or reinforcement will have some other microstructure and so on. The advantage is uh, they are very strong, stiff and uh, light weighting very importantly. Disadvantage is uh, very high cost and uh, they may lose their uh, the togetherness by delamination that fiber will pull off or you know it get delaminated from the matrix. These are the properties which will deteriorate the mechanical behavior and so on. So, you see that this table uh, clearly demonstrates that uh, it, there is a strong connection um, between the chemical bond of a material and what kind of mechanical property they exhibit, okay. there is a strong connection. So, that is that is the reason we are looking at uh, chemical bonding uh, much more closely. So, uh, the next important uh, subject I want to just go and review uh, like uh, chemical bonding though we all know that. A similar thing uh, subject is strength of materials. So, we will just review this uh, before we uh, proceed further. What is strength of materials? The subject deals with relation between internal forces, deformation and external loads. So, assuming the members are in equilibrium that is static equilibrium, um, the equations from the static equilibrium are applied to forces acting on some part of the body in order to obtain a relationship between external forces acting on the member and the internal forces resisting the action of external loads. You see we want to uh, have some design criteria, okay. So, let us assume that you know uh, you take a material uh, which uh, which is assumed to be in an equilibrium. Uh, in the strength of material concept the static equilibrium equations are applied. So, when the external force act on the body, then the internal forces will resist them. So, the basically the resist internal force resistance is uh, you know uh, termed as a stress, right? the resistance to external force in terms of internal resistance. For example, here we talked about primary bond, secondary bond and so on. So, all these bonds will resist the external force, right. So, that external force will be uh, resisted by internal force. So, which is uh, termed as uh, stress, right. And then uh, we need to look at the stress distribution in the body, whether it is uh, acting in a point or it is where all it is distributed. But the very important point is you just look at it. So, the internal forces that is resist resisting forces are usually expressed by stress acting over a certain area, okay. The stress distribution is arrived at by observing and measuring the strain distribution. So, this is important. So, we are not going to measure the 
stress directly because it cannot be physically measured. Stress cannot be physically measured. So, we are looking for a strain distribution and uh, we will measure the strain distribution by what? The strain distribution, the strain, we will just look at it how we are going to measure the strain through some displacements, right? How from the displacement, how experimentally we will be able to measure the strain that we can see. See, uh, the important assumption in strength of materials are that the body which is being analyzed is continuous, homogeneous and isotropic. So, we should know the meaning of these three words and uh, a continuous body is the one which does not contain voids or empty spaces of any kind. A body is homogeneous if it has identical properties at all points. A body is considered isotropic with respect to some property when that property does not vary with direction or orientation, so directional nature. Okay. So, um, so what strength of material uh, try to do is it it makes some assumptions basically, like the material is uh, continuous, homogeneous and isotropic and so on. Okay. And then um, it try to apply the static equilibrium equations uh, where a, a body is subjected to an external force and uh, the, the resistance from the body at internal forces is being measured as a stress. But then as I just said, stress cannot be experimentally physically measured. So, we look at the deflection or displace, displacement, then we measure a strain and uh, we have the constitutive relations between stress and strain. Um, the most popular one all of us know is Hooke's law, okay. stress, it, has, it states that you know stress will have a linear relationship with strain and so on. So, they are all called constitutive relations. From this constitutive relations, we try to uh, calculate the stress and then from the stress we try to calculate the load and the dimension of the member um, and which will be uh, based upon the material property or mechanical behavior of materials. So, this is the in a nutshell, uh, a strength of material uh, philosophy try to uh, give. So, it is very useful, right. So, for, for as a design engineer, if you want to select a material, okay, if these uh, properties are given or these relations are given or something is known, so you will be able to calculate the, the loads and the dimensions of the material depending upon the specific uh, applications, right. So, um, so, that is uh, philosophy of strength of materials. So, with this uh, background, uh, we will just try to move further. We will look at uh, again elementary uh, properties, elastic and plastic behavior. So, what is shown in this figure is a cylindrical bar which is fixed at one end and uh, which is subjected to an axial load okay, in this direction that is a P, axial load P. And you can see that uh, there are two um, points uh, which, which is referring L naught uh, showing the initial position. Then uh, after you pull this bar to to some extent, then the these two points move to the new positions, which is uh, the distance between the two new points will be L naught plus delta. 
So, what is delta? Delta is the deformation, right. So, you should also think about suppose if you try to pull this rod in this direction, the length increases also a corresponding a diametrical reduction is also expected, right. Okay. So, that is the kind of configuration we are now trying to look at and describe. So, the word average linear strain E, okay, um, is measured here and delta is the deformation, the slight increase in the length and a decrease in the diameter that is what uh, trying to show here. So, it can be written like this the average linear strain is equal to deformation delta divided by original length L naught or change in length by original length can be written as L minus L naught by L naught that is linear average strain. And um, what is shown in this diagram B is a free body diagram where again uh, um, the, the member is being pulled in this direction P and uh, against the against its internal forces uh, it is shown in this kind of uh, small lines and uh, this is an external load P that is what is written here. The external load P is balanced by the internal resisting force, this force uh, which can be an integral of the internal force, resisting force times the area. So, area is dA, this particular area. Uh, so, the equilibrium equation for this particular free body diagram is P is equal to integral sigma dA, okay. And if the stress is distributed uniformly over the area A, if a sigma is constant, then we can say P is equal to sigma integral dA is equal to sigma A or sigma is equal to P by A. So, this is how uh, uh, the stress is being uh, defined and very important thing is the stress will not be uniform over the area A. Therefore, the equation represent average stress, right. So, so this is this is what uh, you have to be um, careful. So, here also we just use the word average strain, here is average stress. So, that means, uh, okay. Uh, when you take a, a body or a, a member which is being pulled in one direction or subjected to an external load, we, the strength of materials concept or continuum assumes that every point of the body undergoes a similar uh, or every point of the body experiences similar load or similar force, okay. Uh, but that need not be the case in reality, right. So, it could be there could be some part will be undergo more stress than the other. So, so we do not have that uh, you know clarity there. So, that is why it is called average uh, stress, right. It is not uh, you know um, stress, um, the stress is not going to be uniform all over the body or even the strain is not going to be uniform. That is why it is called average strain, average stress. So, this we have to keep in mind. So, when you talk about uh, body in equilibrium under the action of external force, there are two kinds of forces. Uh, one is surface forces. What is surface forces? Hydrostatic force, pressure pressure exerted by one body on the other, okay. So, we are seeing that uh, external force uh, on a body, uh, right. So, what kind of force? So, that could be two forces, 
one is uh, surface forces what is the other one other one is a body forces what are body forces a body forces which is distributed over a volume of a body please uh, make a note of it this is over a volume of the body something like a gravitational force magnetic forces or inertia forces they are all called body forces right so in engineering two most common type of body forces are encountered one is the centrifugal force due to high speed rotation and the forces due to temperature differential that is thermal stress these are all two most common type of body forces which uh, is encountered in the engineering applications right so now we will see how to uh, look at the concept of stress at a point right uh, as per the strength of material concepts so look at this uh, diagram which is uh, a, a body which is assumed to be in equilibrium is subjected to external pressures p1 p2 p3 p4 p5 okay and then we are interested in uh, looking at the our stress at a point o in the plane mm okay so the r you can say that this plane mm is bisecting these two uh, parts part 1 and part 2 and this is a x y z coordinate okay so as per the strength of material description so what we can do is uh, we will cut this plane uh, i mean cut this body into two and then what what it means is uh, the the part two comes off from this and then we are interested in measuring the stress at a point o which is which is taken from the whole body like this what it means is you know uh, the, the the removed portion of the body is replaced by the 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 resisting force or external load at this point or at this area okay or otherwise whatever the the the, the forces which were there uh, when these two parts were together it's assumed to be still there and uh, we are interested in looking at uh, the stress at a point o so uh, take area delta a surrounding point o and delta p acts on this area because of this uh, external load if delta a is continuously reduced to zero the limiting value of the ratio delta p by delta a is the stress at the point o on the plane mm of the body two so it is a limiting value of the ratio delta p that is limit delta a tends to zero uh, delta p by delta a which is nothing but a sigma that is stress at a point according to strength of material concept so that is one way of looking at uh, the stress at a point how to visualize or how to grasp the idea okay so um, what are the types of uh, uh, stresses we know like um, if you look at this uh, diagram so you can just assume that this is the same uh, cross section mm in the previous diagram so the sigma what we refer is a total stress uh, that can be always resolved into two components a normal stress sigma uh, which is perpendicular to the area of uh, cross section or the area of interest where we define the o the origin of the point and the shear stress tau lying in the plane mm of the area a okay so what what is uh, the same coordinate uh, coordinate is given, given here uh, assume this this plane is in mm and um, and this is the uh, p 
O P is a similar uh, direction of the load what is given. So, you can see that uh, this plane um, O P is lying in O Z and C this kind of a plane this uh, this vector basically and we now say that sigma the normal stress is equal to P by A cos theta. So, this is uh, P and this is the angle between these two. So, we are looking at a normal stress that means it is normal to this plane. So, it will have this theta component. So, that is why it is P by A cos theta and the shear stress will be in the plane acts along O C. So, this is uh, the angle between y and this plane that is phi. So, tau is p by a sin theta. So, this uh, project this theta and we are looking at the shear and uh, it may be further resolved into two parallel I mean two components parallel to x and y direction lying in the plane. So, the shear stress can be further divided into 2 uh, that is because of this uh, projection. So, P by A sin theta is uh, shear stress and uh, P by A sin theta sin phi is a shear stress acting in x direction and uh, P by A sin theta cos phi is in y direction. So, this is just a, a very convenient way of uh, resolving this, uh, the stresses and this is the way to look at it. So, so when we have a total stress, you should remember that it is always convenient to resolve them into uh, a shear stress and a normal stress, right. So, this is a convention uh, which is being followed. So, I thought first I will introduce this then before we get into this next one.